Dr. Rigby for that excellent presentation. And as, uh, as you can tell by all the questions, it's a very uh, topic that's very interesting to many people. Um, at this time, we'd like to uh, um, uh, introduce our next speaker. is Dr. Megan Grundan Grunander. Uh, she's going to be speaking on antibiotics for appendicitis. First of all, I'd like to, again, thank Ogden Clinic for being a sponsor, along with uh, Epic. Um, uh, and if there's anyone from Epic who is here, uh, can we just have them stand and acknowledge them? I don't know if they would like to thank those sponsors uh, for, uh, for helping out with this presentation. Uh, Megan Grunander is, was raised in North Ogden. She graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Zoology with minors in both chemistry and technical cells from Weber State University. In 2005, she graduated from the University of Utah School of Medicine. She completed her general surgery internship at the University of California, San Francisco, and her general surgery residence residency at Harbor UCLA Medical Center, where she served as chief resident. She also completed a fellowship in surgical critical care at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center, where she passed the surgical critical care board's exam. In 2011, Grunander joined the Ogden Clinic upon completion of her training. Uh, Dr. Grunander is married to her uh, high school sweetheart, who is an orthopedic surgeon uh, with the Carlton Harrison Clinic at McKady Hospital. She has two children, Grace, who is four years old, and Graham, who is one. In her free time, she likes to travel with her family, ski, water ski, wakeboard, run, attend sporting events, and play the piano. Uh, please welcome with me Dr. Megan Grunander. Good morning. I'm really excited to be here. I was actually the opening speaker at this conference four years ago and spoke about bleeding and trauma and had some really great graphic pictures that I showed while everyone was trying to eat breakfast. So I thought, for sure, I'm never getting invited back to this conference. So I'm really honored that they would ask me to come and speak about something that is really gaining a lot of attention in the world of general surgery. And that is to operate or not to operate. What is, that is the question. Should appendectomy or should antibiotics be the treatment of choice for uncomplicated acute appendicitis? And we're gonna delve into this more. Uh, I just came back from a national meeting for trauma and acute care surgery, and over the three-day conference, this topic was given the most amount of time. So it definitely is something that's garnering attention and warrants having a discussion about. I have nothing to disclose. So I'm gonna start by just telling you a little bit about my daughter, Grace, who's four. She, we teased that when she was born, she better be ready to operate because she learned literally all of general surgery while I was pregnant. While I was preparing and taking review courses for my written boards, I actually flew to Philadelphia when I was 38 weeks pregnant to take my oral boards and thought I was probably in labor as we were flying home because I was having such bad contractions. And as I kind of got up for about the fifth time to walk the aisles and see if my contractions would let up a little bit, the poor lady sitting on my row really started getting concerned and I was like, don't worry about it, I'm a doctor. I'll walk you through delivering this baby. But she hung in there for eight more days, and then I had her uh, the week after I passed my oral boards. So she loves medicine. She loves to go with me to the hospital, and we round together on Fridays and sometimes Saturdays, and she takes her little Doc McStuffins, you know, doctor's kid, and she'll place it on the end of the bed, and she'll tell everyone in the room that she is there to make them feel better. Now, I think the crackers and the juice that the nurses all get her when she comes to the nursing, uh, nursing desk makes a difference, but she does love medicine. So at night, she likes to ask my husband and I, what cases do you have tomorrow? What did you do today? Well, why did you do that? How do you do that? And she's really interested. She wants the details of how we operate and what we do. Well, she's pretty astute, and she's realized that when I'm on call, and she'll ask, well, why are you leaving? What are you going to do? Appendicitis is really a frequent cause of why I leave. So she, like this little girl in the cartoon, has asked, well, what does the appendix do? All you do is go in and take it out. So I'd like to tease with her that, well, it just keeps me from getting my beauty sleep at night, as the patients usually present later at night because they've tried to go home and tried to go to sleep, and then they can't, so then they present and are finally worked up maybe two or three in the morning and are ready to have their appendectomy. But before we sentence the appendix to just this kind of non-essential support group for organs that aren't needed, the appendix actually really does have a purpose, and we're gonna start by talking about that today. So we're gonna reach back to the depths of your memory and remember back in embryology and anatomy and kind of your first year of medical school, 
So the appendix is a blind ending tube that comes off of the cecum from where it developed embryologically. Uh, it's been long accepted that the appendix has gut-associated lymphoid tissue within it, but there still has been this notion that the appendix really doesn't serve a purpose as there was felt to be minimal side effects with the removal of the appendix. Well, in 2007, Duke started to rebuke this and found that patients who had uh, that the appendix actually served as a haven and kind of a reservoir to replenish the intestines of the good bacteria that we know live within the intestines. So after they had been flushed by either viral illness or antibiotic treatment, that the appendix then probably served as a reservoir to replenish those good bacteria. A few years later, Winthrop University then came through and supported, the, supported this notion as they found that patients who had had an appendectomy and then had Clostridium difficile infection were actually four times as likely to have recurrent C. diff in the absence of an appendix. It's also recently been identified that the appendix can serve as an important component of mammalian mucosal immune system and component, particularly with B lymphocytes and extrathymically derived T lymphocytes. And it's well known that the appendix does contain lymphatic vessels that can help to regulate pathogens. So just a quick reminder of where, you know, in the right lower quadrant, there's the cecum, it's the terminal ileum meat, and as you follow the anti-mesenteric tinea coli, there you'll find the appendix. So appendicitis, why does it occur? Well, it occurs because of an obstruction of the lumen of the appendix. This subsequently leads to edema, inflammation, overgrowth of bacteria. Um, in children, appendicitis can often be caused by uh, hypertrophy of the lymphatic vessels and the lymphatic uh, tissue that is there. A good masquerader of appendicitis in children is actually that of mesenteric lymphadenitis, which children will develop, particularly of the lymph nodes within the right lower quadrant, secondary to viral infections. In adults, fecaliths can be a common cause of appendicitis. And for my orthopedic surgeon husband, who's in the back and didn't know what a fecalith was, it's just a little flick of stool that's come from the cecum and fallen down into the lumen of the appendix and then has obstructed the appendix. Uh, appendicil tumors are also an important cause of appendicitis and shouldn't be ignored. The majority of appendicil tumors that we will find are actually when patients present with signs and symptoms of appendicitis. In adults who are presenting with concerns for appendicitis over the age of 40, us as general surgeons really want those patients to have a CT scan regardless of how classic their symptoms are because now you're getting to the age range where an appendicil tumor may actually be the cause of their appendicitis and that changes the treatment course completely. Overall, your lifetime risk of developing appendicitis is between 7 and 9 percent. So as this obstruction occurs and, this pro and the disease process progresses, you then can develop some necrosis of the walls of the appendix, which then can lead to inflammation and perforation. However, perforation is not inevitable. You can have patients who can present with appendicitis and they can have been having symptoms for four days and be just fine. And you can have patients that will endorse that they've had symptoms for 24 or 36 hours and have a perforation and an abscess already at that time. The mortality rate for appendicitis is low. It's less than 1%. However, it can creep up to as high as 15% when you start talking about elderly patients and those with other comorbid conditions. So how do we diagnose appendicitis? So periumbilical pain, then localizing to the right lower quadrant. Uh, it can be associated with fevers, chills, nausea, diarrhea, anorexia. As interns and junior residents in surgery are often kind of taught the informal hamburger sign that when you would be interviewing the patients, you would ask them if they felt hungry. And if they did, it was supposed to lower your suspicion sum of appendicitis. I don't know that there's really any good literature about that, but it's what we were taught when we were training. Uh, on physical exam, tenderness to palpation in the right lower quadrant, particularly at what we call McBurney's point, which is two-thirds of the way between the umbilicus and the right anterior superior iliac spine. You can also try to elicit a Rovzing sign, which is when you palpate in the left lower quadrant, but the patient will endorse pain in the right lower quadrant. Uh, laboratory studies. Not all patients with appendicitis will have an elevated white count, but you will look to at least see the trend of neutrophils rising up and having a left shift to endorse some form of acute infection that the body is trying to fight. Ultrasound is a good diagnostic modality that you can use, particularly in children and teenagers. It is limited by body habitus, and you really need the patients to be rather skinny for it to be of any help. 
When you do the ultrasound, you look for a non-compressible tubular structure within the right lower quadrant measuring approximately one centimeter or more. The other benefit that ultrasound has is although you may not identify appendicitis, it does also help to rule out other uh, disease processes such as gynecologic things that could be happening in younger females and could be masquerading as the symptoms of appendicitis. CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis with oral and IV contrast is the treatment, the diagnostic treatment of choice that us as the surgeons prefer. Uh, this helps you to see is there truly an appendicitis? It also looks for rupture and perforation, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. And then you can consider obtaining an MRI if you have a patient presenting with right lower quadrant pain who is pregnant, as this will help to spare the fetus from any radiation exposure. It's not always as helpful, but it is a decent starting place in these patients. So here's just a picture, this periumbilical region localizing to the right lower quadrant. Again, when we talk about right lower anything, my husband thinks it's the extremity. So this is just a good picture reminding him that the, the abdomen has quadrants too that we refer to as right and left and lower and upper. So here's some CT scans, and they're probably a little difficult to see, but the image on the upper left is that of a normal appendix. The appendix is air-filled. It's thin-walled. There's no stranding. There's no inflammation. That's a completely normal-appearing appendix. These other three images are that of acute appendicitis without perforation or rupture. And so you can see the picture in the upper left is kind of looking at it to kind of end on where the other ones, you can see the appendix being laid out. Now, although this doesn't go along with some of the talk, uh, I think it's important to touch on for just a minute that of ruptured appendicitis with an abscess because it does change our treatment plan some. So I think it warrants just a minute or two of discussion. So this is a CT scan of an, a, a ruptured appendicitis. You can see over here kind of on the far left of the picture where the arrow is pointing, you can actually see the tip of the appendix blown out. You can see some fluid and stranding there, and then you can see kind of in the mid portion of the picture, there's actually an abscess secondary to the ruptured appendicitis. And then they've also got an arrow pointing on a fecalith, which is kind of just free floating now into the abdomen. So ruptured appendicitis, these are patients that present with symptoms usually lasting greater for 24 hours and really more like 72 or more hours. You know, I trained at a county hospital in LA where literally some of our patients would wait up to three days in the waiting room to get back and see us if you were pretty non-acute with your symptoms. And we would have patients endorse saying, man, I felt horrible that first day I was here in the ER. And then my pain kind of got better, but now it's horrible again. And that's usually when they rupture. They build all this pressure within the appendix. And then when it actually perforates, they do get a little bit of some pain relief. And then as the peritonitis worsens, their pain comes back. Um, Fecalists are also often associated when you will have the appendix rupture. You'll have findings on the CT scan like we, that previous slide, of an abscess, or even without an abscess, findings and changes of what we call a phlegmon, which is thick inflammatory tissue that the patient may then be on their way to developing an abscess. And the treatment for these patients is not immediate surgery unless peritonitis is present. The treatment option for these patients is IV antibiotics and then plus or minus CT guided drainage of an abscess if there is an abscess amenable to drain. If patients present with a phlegmon and there's nothing really to drain, then what we will do is admit them to the hospital, give them several days of IV antibiotics, and then usually rescan them at about 48 to 72 hours to look and see if an abscess has developed, which often it does, and then go on with CT guided drainage of the abscess at that time. Now, if these patients do have peritonitis, well, then they need surgery. We will try to do it laparoscopically, but these patients are at very high risk for requiring an open procedure, and even an ileal cecectomy, because the cecum will become so inflamed from the infection that oftentimes you can't get a stapler or anything across the cecum where you're going to divide the appendix without concern that you're going to have a leak from that area. So oftentimes you do have to perform an ileal cecectomy. It's rare, but it does happen. Uh, <clears throat> if you are able to treat these patients non-operatively initially, then at three months you can discuss with them the option of an interval appendectomy. This is a little bit of a debated topic within general surgery. I think if you polled the eight surgeons that are here in Ogden, probably half of us talk about it, half of us don't. We do know there's good literature to support that there's approximately a 35% recurrence rate of appendicitis once you've treated the patients non-operatively initially, so it is a discussion worth having with your patients and at least talking to them about them proceeding. 
We wait the three months to let all of that inflammation and in, uh, inflammatory tissue settle so that you can then proceed with a relatively straightforward outpatient laparoscopic appendectomy. And even with all of our best diagnostic tools every now and then, we're wrong. And we can go to the OR and do an appendectomy and the pathology can come back as normal. And that's OK. It's accepted that you can have a 15% negative appendectomy rate and be well within uh, the national standards. So let's talk about a little bit more about appendectomies as it pertains to uncomplicated acute appendicitis. So appendectomy was actually first performed in the mid-18th century by someone named Amignon. And he was actually performing a right inguinal hernia repair and was found, the hernia was found to contain an inflamed appendix. So he removed the appendix and repaired the hernia. Uh, he now has a hernia named after him, which is a right inguinal hernia that you then found, find to contain an appendix, whether it be inflamed or not. The pathology of appendicitis was then later described in the late 1800s, and as my daughter Grace has realized, this is still one of the most common surgeries performed in the United States today. So laparoscopic appendectomy has now become the standard treatment for appendicitis. It's an outpatient procedure, as the, greater than 90% of the patients will go home within 23 hours of surgery. And there are actually now published protocols that hospitals can follow that will discharge patients within 171 minutes from the completion of surgery, which essentially means the surgery is completed, the patient goes to the recovery room, and then they go home, and the patients do great. Uh, you, patients usually return to work within a week. We do give them activity restrictions of no lifting, pushing, or pulling, anything heavier than 10 pounds for four weeks. And this is going to come into play later on as we start to talk about the comparison of antibiotics. But the average cost of an outpatient laparoscopic appendectomy is $23,000. This is a picture of where we place our trocars and how we go about performing a laparoscopic appendectomy. So the trocar there at the umbilicus is what we use as our camera port. So you do, it does take two people. You've got to have one holding the camera. And then your other two trocar sites are what we call our working ports. Usually the one in the suprapubic region, you'll use your left hand and grasp the appendix, put some tension on it, and then dissect with your right hand, staple with your right hand. That trocar in the left lower quadrant is where you'll spread the muscle apart, take the appendix out of the abdomen, and then because that trocar site is usually a 12 millimeter trocar site to facilitate passage of the stapler, you do have to put a transfascial stitch there to pull that fascia together to try and help prevent the occurrence of an incisional hernia. So the patients will often tease, man, I went to surgery with pain on my left or on my right, and now I woke up with pain on my left. But that's just because that incision site is the most tender where we put that stitch. They usually won't even notice uh, pain from the other two trocar sites. These are some pictures uh, interoperatively. The one on the left is a normal appendix. It's very soft. It's not inflamed. It's not thickened. It's normal color. These other two are what we would find consistent with uncomplicated appendicitis. It's thickened. It's inflamed. It's erythematous. Uh, but no evidence of perforation or rupture. Just angry appendix. All right. So now we're going to transition on to talking about antibiotics only and whether this should be the treatment of choice for uncomplicated appendicitis. Because like this guy, maybe you don't want your appendix beat out of you. So why is this a hot topic in general surgery now? There have been several notable studies within the last two years that have really brought this to the forefront and asked getting the question asked, should appendicitis be treated with antibiotics only? Now keep in mind, it's a, it's a small subset of patients that they're looking at. When we say uncomplicated acute appendicitis, no perforation, no rupture, no phlegmon, these are the patients usually presenting within 24 to 36 hours with just straightforward appendicitis. So most notably is the NOTA study and then the APAC trial. And we're going to talk about the details of those and a little bit about these studies. These other two studies that I've listed are in addition to numerous other studies. They were really meta-analyses looking at the number of smaller trials out there and trying to come to a consensus of what really should be the treatment option of choice. So the NOTA study, performed in 2010, and it enrolled 159 patients. These patients were treated with seven days of Augmentin. 
The seven-day failure rate was almost uh, 12%, and after two years, the recurrence rate was essentially 14%. Now, of the 22 patients that recurred within the first two years, 14 of them were successfully treated with another round of antibiotic therapy. The APEC trial is the largest trial that's been performed to date, and this was carried on in Finland from 2009 to 2012. And this enrolled 530 patients. And it followed these patients at specified intervals via telephone. Now, those that were randomized to the antibiotic therapy group received IV erdipenem for three days, followed by a weak course of oral levoquin and flagell. In the antibiotic group, 27% had an appendectomy performed within one year. Now, it's a little unclear how they actually went on to document whether this was just persistent pain, image-guided or image-directed uh, documentation of a recurrence of appendicitis, but 27% subsequently underwent appendectomy following that initial round of antibiotics. The whole outcome that was assessed by this study was just to see if it was inferior to treat patients with IV antibiotics versus surgery. And they could not document non-inferiority. And it's interesting, one of the general surgery journals just came through maybe two weeks ago and there was an article talking about this. And the consensus was they looked at literally every study out there and their consensus was, well, it's probably safe as first line if you're careful about the patients you choose, but really there's no good consensus statement from anyone that's going to come and no study that will show that it is superior to that of appendectomy. So what's the cost of antibiotics only? Well, in these studies, $24,000 was the average cost. This included the three days of hospitalization that it was required for the IV antibiotics and then the additional oral antibiotics for one week's time. Just to remind you, a few slides ago, we talked about the cost of laparoscopic appendectomy being $23,000. So no cost savings, at least in the studies as they were performed up to this date. Um, and this cost of $24,000 is not able to truly quantify the additional costs that may be incurred by additional ER or primary care visits because of continued or recurrent right lower quadrant pain, additional imaging being done to see if there is a recurrence of uh, appendicitis, additional lost days of work, additional hospital days for another round or continued course of antibiotics, or then even undergoing subsequently surgery. So you may ask, well, if you haven't been able to prove that antibiotics only are, are not inferior, maybe not superior, but not inferior, then really why is surgery being done? Well, these studies are significantly, significantly flawed. Uh, <clears throat> there was in the APAC trial, which was that largest trial, that 530 patients, their definition of enrolling patients was symptoms and then CT imaging. Well, on CT, their criteria for appendicitis was an appendix of six millimeters or more. Well, that's a normal appendix. Really, you have to get above eight millimeters and even on your way to 10 millimeters and then also have signs of thick walls. Uh, associated stranding and inflammation to really then meet diagnostic, at least radiographically, criteria of appendicitis. And here we're using a criteria of a normal appendix, essentially. There's no clear guidelines as to whether to give IV antibiotics, oral antibiotics, some combination of the two, whether uh, you can, how long of a treatment course, what antibiotics to use. Another study actually used imipenem as one of their antibiotics of choice. Well, this is over $1,000 a dose, and you are putting the patients at risk for subsequent antibiotic resistance because of its great broad spectrum coverage, which is why we save it for more aggressive bacteria. All of the studies, including the NOTA and the APAC trial, used open appendectomy as their surgical intervention. Well, as we've talked about, like, Really, we very rarely do open appendectomies anymore. Even in children, up here, my kind of rule, uh, some of it being limited by our pediatric support at the hospital, but my rule is five. Five and above, I'll take your appendix out. Four and below, you probably ought to be down at primaries. But regardless of where you are, toddlers, young children, you're having laparoscopic appendectomies. I can maybe do one appendectomy a year, and it's usually because it's a patient that is so sick, I can't get it out laparoscopically. I mean, that's how the standard of laparoscopic appendectomies have come to be. So when you're doing these studies and you're comparing them to open appendectomies, well, just in the nature of open appendectomy is going to increase your cost because patients are going to be in the hospital longer and have a slower return to work. Uh, 
And then there's also no clear definition as to what truly constituted antibiotic failure or recurrence in the patients that were treated with antibiotics only. So what are some other things that we still don't know at this time about what antibiotic-only therapy uh, could do and how it may hurt us? Well, really, none of these studies have given and presented a clear optimal criteria selection for the patients that you would enroll into this. Uh, fecalists, you know, as we talked about, if you've got a fecalith, you're probably, even if you treat them successfully one time with IV antibiotics, they're going to be at high risk for occurrence because that fecalith is still there, and they're going to be at risk for having that appendix obstruct again. So how do we select patients and know that we'll have pretty good outcomes and safely be able to treat them with antibiotics only? Who are the patients that are at higher risk for failure? What's the optimal antibiotic choice and how should it be given? Even if we're to say give IV antibiotics only and send them to infusion center, even do it as an outpatient where you just send them to an infusion center, what's the cost of that? Can you, again, and going on to the next point, can you this be done as an outpatient? What are the longer term outcomes? What are the five year outcomes on this? What's the incidence of missed malignancies and neoplasms? And then also we need more data to compare antibiotics only to laparoscopic appendectomy. And then what's the safety and the efficacy that can be formed in the extremes of ages, the young and the old? Because these patients were all excluded from all these trials and even teenagers were excluded. You really had to be, the ages for most of these studies encompassed 18 to 65. And then carrying on, does initial treatment with antibiotics only increase subsequent hospital utilization because every time the patient has any sort of right lower quadrant pain, are they going to be seeking medical attention because they're fearful that their appendicitis is back? And then, although high-risk patients who probably could benefit from antibiotic-only therapy, uh, those uh, elderly, multiple medical comorbidities, high risk for surgery, they potentially could benefit if their selection criteria met. These patients were also excluded from all of these studies. So a lot of questions still left to be answered. So my takeaway from this is I've read it. If your site hurts, you need an appendectomy. Now, is that going to change five years from now? It very well may. There are studies that are beginning to go through the process of enrolling patients, treat antibiotics only, look at laparoscopic appendectomies, how they compare, and try to make some stronger criteria and recommendations in regards to how antibiotic therapy should look. But for now, if you come to the emergency room and you call me about an appendectomy, you're get, or an appendicitis, you're gonna get an appendectomy. Thank you. Any questions? Well, I, a question just practically speaking. So, you know, with the imaging study now, we can make diagnosis so much easier. And uh, so working in an Instacare situation, people have belly pain, do a scan, looks like appendicitis, and we call your colleagues. Mm -hmm. And then the question has come up, who discusses the nuances of this issue of <laughs> surgery? Your colleagues are at home. We appreciate that. What are we going to do with them? They're sitting in an out, outpatient. Sure. So just kind of a what, what's your sense and what, what's the surgical community want us to do in that situation? I haven't brought this up with RER. I don't know what some of my other colleagues are, but I feel like it's my duty to come in and talk to you because one, it's my duty to talk to you about the risks of surgery and what that entails, but also talk to you about the benefits and the risks that would go along with antibiotic-only therapy. Now, I'm really not offering this to my patients because again, there's no good literature to support it and appendectomy is so low risk, but I do think it probably falls on the shoulders of the surgeons because you're the ones that need to talk to them about the risk of surgery and the risk and benefit of both therapies. Hello? Yeah. Uh, please tell us about the specific recommendations when a woman gets uh, appendicitis during pregnancy. How do we manage? So we need to try and treat the patient with an appendectomy. We know that women that are pregnant who then go on to rupture or perforate, there is an extremely high risk of fetal mortality in that case. And so then appendectomy is the treatment recommendation of choice. In patients that are in their first and second trimester, you can still safely do a laparoscopic appendectomy. As patients get into their third trimester, then you probably need to do an open appendectomy and you can make an incision there in the right lower quadrant, but you do have to keep in mind that as the uterus grows, it often will push the appendix up into the right upper quadrant. So as these 
patients progress through pregnancy, patients with appendicitis may actually come in complaining of right upper quadrant pain when it really is their appendix. Thank you. You're welcome. Presumably, uh, you have a situation if uh, good surgical care is not available, you might uh, start somebody uh, on uh, antibiotics for what looks like appendicitis. What is your choice for starting? Not IVs, this would have to be oral. Oral, then I would do levoquinone flagell and do double therapy. Both of them are generics, both of them are pretty cheap, but they have good coverage for the bugs that we know would be involved with appendicitis. For what period of time? At least a week. And then follow their symptoms. Again, there's no clear data to support this, but I would treat them for at least a week. Any data on those, then the uh, subsequent indications for an interval appendectomy? So here again, in, if you've treated them with, for just what you've presumed is uncomplicated appendicitis? No, the majority of studies that are performed that, in, that look at the performance of interval appendectomy and the appendicitis recurrence rate is those who have been treated because of perforated appendicitis not patients that had uncomplicated appendicitis, because those patients up to now have just been treated with an appendectomy from the get-go. Is there an indication for a scan in such a patient? After Post-treatment. Post Post-treatment. When, when it became available. No, not if their symptoms have improved. Unless you have some, I guess it would depend on their age and you worry that are you missing an underlying appendiceal malignancy or some other, like do you have a sequel perforated diverticulitis that was just a micro perforation? Do you have some sort of inflammatory bowel disease that's presenting? So I guess you have to weigh the age of the patient, their other medical comorbidities, their family history, and the risk that they may have something else other than just a straightforward appendicitis. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.